All right, everyone. Here, here we go again. Another No Give Required podcast. I have someone here to me special because I know him for quite some time. As always, Professor Jay-Z Ballos. Thanks for being here with me. Always. Never leave me alone. And again, Mikey, thank you for do all the, the hard work and we take the credits, all right? <laughs> <laughs> but that's part of the job. Mr. Eric Acha, boy, thanks for being here, sir. I'm happy to be here, Master Janja. Professor Jay, I am nervous. I didn't think I'd be this nervous. Oh, man. What wait, are you guys doing to me? And wait and see know. the questions we have for you, man. That's oh, man. <laughs> Lately, we've been telling people it can be a podcast, interview, or it could be a roast. I, just, <laughs> I don't, don't know. know. <laughs> Let's see. Let's see what's going to happen, <laughs> sir. But I'm happy to be here. It's great to always be near, near you guys and here at HQ. Um, let me start this way. I know, as I just mentioned you, is that correct? 22 years also as a, a law enforcement? Yes, sir. 22 years total in law enforcement. And let me ask you, when that idea starts on you to be part of a law enforcement or with something that just happened or what was that as a child um, growing up and end up being in a I, law enforcement? I... Growing up, I, I didn't like cops. Um, I, I had no intention of being a police officer. And then I had a friend, his name was Juan, and he was a reserve officer for a city where I was living in. And I said, reserve officer, what is that? And he was like, well, it's kind of, you're a part-time volunteer police officer. You're not full-time, you don't get a salary, but you get to do all the same things that cops do. And around the same time I discovered that he was a reserve officer, I had another friend named Jan who um, was visiting from Florida. And Jan brought a bunch of guns with him from Florida. And I had never shot a gun before. So he took a shooting, and I was like, whoa, I really enjoyed this. It's like, now how can I carry a gun and do this. And I kid you not, from that very simple, silly, almost childish idea, I got it in my brain that I wanted to be a police officer. And as a matter of fact, um, I remember the exact day I said it. We were, I was just dating my wife, Christine, at the time. We were at her mom's house in Las Vegas. And I remember saying to everyone in the group, I'm going to go do it. I'm going to go be a police officer. Two years later, after taking the classes, you know, there I was. 23 years old, and I had no clue what I was doing, honestly. I literally had no clue. And how was that for you, like being 22 years? And is, if you can share also some of the oh, situations man. that maybe danger, funny. Oh, man. Or maybe a prank from your partners. It's oh. always happened. Oh, th there was always pranks. Um, <laughs> <laughs> pranks are plenty. Um, one of the funniest things, um, I, I just graduated from the academy, so you, you're going to have to picture this a little bit. Part of the drills in the academy is you, um, you do a dummy drag, which is you kind of have a, a, a lifelike dummy with arms hanging out, similar to grappling dummies. You get behind it, and you put your arms around the chest, and then you drag it backwards. It's like a 100, 150-pound dummy, and you have to drag it a certain distance. Well... I get sent to my first dead body call. Someone says, hey, we haven't seen Grandpa Joe. We're trying to get a hold of him. We can't figure out what's going on. I go to the house. I kind of peek in, and I see he's on the ground. I said, okay, well, you know, this is tragic, and I kind of go in there. And, yeah, so go ahead and call the medics. Medics come in. They say, well, he's dead. Now you have to wait for the coroner. So now I'm sitting in a room with a dead body on the floor, and I'm brand new out of the academy, and I'm sitting there, and funny things start to happen in your head when you see this. You know, every now and then, you'll kind of look around, and you'll say, did that thing just move? You kind of look over at it. No. <laughs> you'll hear a funny noise. You'll be like, what the? So about 45 minutes passes, and my mind is already going through all these <laughs> things, right? So I'm, I'm getting a little creeped out. So the, the coroner says, hey, can you help me move the body? Sure. Now, the body was on its back, so having come from the academy, what do I do? I lift it up. Put my hands around the chest, like from behind, and I gable grip, and then I start to pull up to help the coroner get him up. The coroner grabs the pant legs to lift up the body. I go grab the the chest. As I pull up, the body goes. <sighs> oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> I, I squeeze the chest, 
<laughs> and the thing makes a sound. I drop it and I back up and I bang into the wall. And in the corner is like, first time? I was like, yes. And he goes, grab the clothes. <laughs> okay. So <laughs> I will never forget that. Uh, that was, and, and, um, thank God I was alone. I don't share that story much because if you share it with anyone from the police department at the time it happened, they will never, ever let you live it down. <laughs> That's just how it is. But anyway, that was one of the funny stories. <laughs> Wild. Oh man! <laughs> I know, um, and and I'm sure you you end up going practice shooting and doing all of yes, these. Like yes, if you on the beginning want to carry the gun and, <laughs> and be legally doing that. And, yes. Oh my goodness! <laughs> and then that was it. It, it. It's it's really odd when you look back at it and you take an honest look at it. You know, it wasn't anything. Um, you know, it wasn't like a movie where I wanted to go protect and serve. No, literally, I want and as I grew into the position, I began to realize the weight of what I was doing as I grew into the position. And it wasn't something that I contemplated a lot. It was just almost like a, um, something that I felt I needed to do inside me, but it wasn't something that I reflected on a lot. And it was just something that you jump in, and it's much like everyone's path in jiu-jitsu, right? When you just start, and as you progress and you begin to understand more and more, it becomes more complex, and it becomes part of your being. And after 22 years, it becomes a major, major part of you. And now what I'm seeing is how much of what I did as a police officer relate 100% to what we do in jiu-jitsu. And now that's my passion is trying to connect those two worlds and trying to connect it in a way that makes sense for those who travel the path. And when was the beginning of your jiu-jitsu life? When when that start and how and why? What was the reason? How that happened with you? I, I've always been into martial arts. I remember I um I was born and raised in the Philippines, and we came to this country when I was nine years old. So, and I remember my grandma actually made my first gi in the Philippines. They don't sell, so my grandma was a seamstress. I wish I would have kept it. I, I don't know what happened to it, but she made my first gi. And so I've always been into martial arts. I've done karate. I've done, I've done a lot of things. And then um, I remember I was I was a black belt in karate, and I kept seeing this guy Hoist Gracie. You know, I kept hearing about him, and I would always go to the Seven Eleven and look at the black belt magazines, and just 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 had a martial arts kind of um, centered life. And then my first jujitsu class, I went to Hal Gracie Mountain View, and I got killed, <laughs> just destroyed. And this is one of the stumbling blocks for most police officers is I encountered it right then and there. Ah, I don't need this. I'll just shoot the person. My ego got in the way of learning. I don't need this. No, I'll go do this. So I went away mad. And then I started thinking, I go, man, that was, that was something, I, I got to do it again. Try it again. Get beat up, disappear for three months. Try it again, disappear for another two months. You, you just keep doing this process until at, I got to a point where I just needed to be honest with myself. And that was something that I figured out looking back now that I had a lot of difficulty with at the time. And I just said, you know, I just have to do this and I have to learn. And I found a school where I can train consistently once, twice a week. And that's how it started. And we're talking about a lot of years ago, right, Jay? Yeah, Hoist Gracie, Half Gracie. Yes. First generation. It was, it was, it was, uh, it was many, many, many years ago. Um, this is probably 2000, early 2000s, maybe. Um, and, you know, I used to watch videos, of, YouTube videos of you. I, I remember one of the first... You know, John Jacques Machado videos was the top, the the five most favorite finishing moves. Oh yeah, the yeah. one with the five. That and, was one and of the another first funny ones. thing is that guy asked me to do that, but it wasn't my favorite. He just <laughs> added as a favorite. But I said, no, can you show five different techniques and we can call the five favorites? Okay, this one is cool. We showed that one, but I actually don't do any of those. <laughs> They're not my favorites at all. But I think it sold pretty good. <laughs> And that, that, that was the, that was one of my first things. And then, uh, you know, 17, 18 years later, here I am. I'm still... And let's just speed up here, f moving forward. And as you mentioned, you have now, you said that you were able to merge 
the law enforcement, the police officer with jiu-jitsu and felt that connection yes. of, in a way, the way I say that we serve people. We provide them instructions, a lot of things that help them on their lives for sure. And when was the first time we met? I think it was a seminar at your school, wasn't it? Yeah, it was uh, eight years ago, actually. Eight years ago, a couple of, um, it was eight years ago, and it was here at headquarters, and I'll, I'll never forget this. And um, Me neither. Yeah. <laughs> but I'll let you finish the story. <laughs> we had, uh, we, we had, uh, you know, um, I was a purple belt at the time, and I, uh, I had separated from my old school, and I was looking for an affiliation. I sent out three emails to three different associations, one being um, John Jacques Machado and Professor J. And the only person that answered was Professor J. The minute he answered it, I was right on. I was right on, and I think within days or maybe a week or days, we, I was planning Man, on I'm, coming I'm down. Lucky, I'm lucky you sent that message because uh, if it wasn't me, I probably was still waiting until today. <laughs> Special Brazilian guy to respond that email. It's like, oh, how do I write this? And there'll be no. It was it was it was very short because I remember um, whenever anybody would inquire, uh, I, that's kind of what I do. I help with the or, the organization, but. There's I a, just take the credits, but Jay's the one behind all of this. But we, we vet everybody, you know? So a big part of, like, you know what it's like as a student learning the art? No one can do it for you. You, gotta, you have to put in the time, and like you said, be honest with yourself. You know, you'll grow more the more work you put into it. So I can't tell you how many times, you know, people will apply and I'll respond and communicate, but then I will purposely kind of pull back because I, it's it's one of those things, how bad do you want it? And it's not that I don't want people to be a part of what we do. Of course I do, but we're not going to run your school for you. Like you have to have that ability to just take charge and take action. We're here to support and to help provide as much as we can, but it, it all starts and ends with you. So I remember this. I responded and I said, um, everything seemed really good. We, we, we checked you out. You and I talked a little bit, but I'm like, okay, now we need to meet because this, you're going to make a, 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 a commitment. A commitment. This can't be done email. Let's meet. So I'm thinking, okay, we'll plan something. He'll fly down in a couple of weeks or a month or whatever. He's like, no, I'll see you tomorrow. I remember that you said, I'll yeah. be down tomorrow. And I was like, whoa, okay. He means business. Yeah. Yes. We went, we went and had coffee across the street. Brought you in here, introduced you to Jean Jacques, and the rest is history. Now, do you want to know the most impactful moment of those few I days do. for me? I do. I remember I came in. I was a purple belt, and first of all, I was just astonished at the number of black belts that were on the mat. And we had a great training session. And then you immediately you trained with me, Master Jean Jacques. You introduced yourself. And after all is said and done, as class is winding down, you may not remember this, but I'm sitting against the wall. And you walked up to me and you asked me if I wanted to be a part of your association. You asked me, I'm a purple belt and I'm sitting here and I'm going, three weeks ago, I was watching a YouTube channel with Master Jean Jacques. Now he's here, I've rolled with him and he's asking me, a nobody essentially, if I wanted to be a part of this, associ of, of this association. I've worked with a lot of leaders throughout my career and been around a lot of people, but that top-down leadership, when something like that, it means it meant everything to me. And that's, that, that was the moment that cemented for me that I, I was in the right place um, and that I had a place where I can grow and that I can learn and I can be under the tutelage of true leadership. And you might not remember that, but you asking a, a coral belt, asking a purple belt, if the purple belt would like to be a part of their show. I mean, I was... I, I couldn't believe it. But you know, we learned that, man, I'm still, and I always do that. And the time that I step on the mat, I want to make sure I shake. And you, you see, yes. I shake everyone's hand. I look everyone in, in the eyes. Man, I'm, I'm no better than anybody else. I know I think we, we all have something that we do better than anybody in life. But we're all humans, you know. And uh, I felt from you, and that's what I'm saying, jiu-jitsu, it's hard for people to lie. You show on the mat who you are. I don't know how can I pick that, but I learned from the prior generation in my family to how important it is. And I want to make sure that everybody that is step on the mat in my school, they are very important to me. 
it's not if you have more money, less money, if you're famous or famous, man, we're there, we're all the same, we all have the same importance on the mat. And I think just the fact that next day you're already here, then that shows like how much actually you mm -hmm. mean, how much you actually want. And we are so glad and, and I think, I don't know how long after that we set up a kind of a seminar at your school. Yeah, it was, it was just a few months later. I think it was maybe four or five months later. I think um, I joined in April and maybe August or September you were, you were at our school. And I remember I mentioned something funny because I think this school was a mix of fitness, workouts, yes. and martial arts. Yes. And I think the incredible thing was, I don't know how many people we have at the seminar, but it was a quite a good number. But I just realized that we're so squish. Everybody's on top of each other. It in was a like smaller area. Mm -hmm. Twenty five percent yes. jujitsu, seventy five percent fitness. Right. But and at the same time, I looked to the other side. Is nobody, or maybe one person, doing some exercise and saying, like, "Man, something's wrong here." Yes. I approached you, say, "Eric, why don't you switch?" Yes. Then I gave you that idea. <laughs> it's like you know what. But <laughs> it, it, it's funny you mentioned that because that was a reflection of. That was a reflection of my beliefs at the time. Um, I was um, I, I was only a purple belt at the time, and I did not yet believe that I had what it took to do to go bigger. And it wasn't until I came here and you kind of gave me the elbow and said, "Hey, you can do this. Just go do it. No excuses. Just go do it." And I remember that day because that was the day I got my brown belt from you that's the day I was promoted and that was the day and you told me um, you said when people come the my only the only direction you ever gave me was as as far as how to run the school and what you expected from the school was when people come by the school or they drive by I want people to look over and say that's a good school that was it that's that's the only direction you gave me and then the other direction you gave me was was in competition because I, I I went ahead and I competed a couple of weeks after that and and uh, I was uh, I was successful in that competition but and and you 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 gave me a very very simple instruction you said you have to believe in you I can put you up against a black belt right now when you will do okay I'm not saying you're gonna win but I can put you up against so you're gonna be okay you basically told me to believe in myself and that's and I think that's how everything starts in life, right? Yes, sir. You know, you you had a choice to change the place, to make the school big or small, or, yeah. but you have to start, like, believe in yourself. And I think jiu-jitsu is something that end up giving us that power, empower us to, to move forward and, and do it. It, it, it really does. And, and I look back now, it's uh, been 10 years since I've had the school and eight years with you and the, the immense growth that we have and, and, and the sustainability that we have now that we've been able to maintain even through the COVID times is because I was, I, I, being successful for me is easy because all I did was copy you guys. It, it boggles my mind when people have to try and reinvent the wheel when they have a successful model in front of them. I come down here to headquarters, yes, to train, but more importantly, to understand the culture so I can take that culture and bring it back to my school. That I think is the most important thing that's kind of led to our success. And I, I, I drill that into my higher belt. You must, you must understand the culture because you're a culture ambassador when it comes, when you come back from HQ, back to PSD. So, you know, um, it's not that complicated. It really, really isn't. And, and how was for you, not now I'm, I'm sure that you understand how how did jiu-jitsu, I don't want to say change us, but how did jiu-jitsu make you see life a little bit different than prior jiu-jitsu? Especially now being involved with so many years, you are a black belt, one of my best guys that I have, has a, a very successful school in jiu-jitsu, which makes me so proud and happy because I remember from the beginning, I saw from day one until today, and it's still growing. How is that turning point for you jujitsu wise how do you apply that on your life oh man i mean um you know where do i start it it, it um you get to a point where when you begin to live the jujitsu lifestyle and you live jujitsu that it's kind of hard to it's hard to blur the two they kind of just blend in you know um you know how how 
I mean, patience is one thing, you know, patience in bad situations. I mean, you know, I, I, um, you, yeah, I'm sure your, your, your audience will get to know Ed 250 pound sores in some <laughs> upcoming, you know, being underneath him requires a lot of patience. And, and, and that's one of the things um, that, that I see, and not just patience. And, and, and if I can just kind of pull back a little bit, because um, one of the main benefits for jujitsu training, for law enforcement, also for regular people, is you develop an ability in jujitsu to be able to make decisions under stress, under real stress, under the worst of conditions, and you are forced repeatedly to make decisions. It's deci- it's a decision making art, and you know police officers have to do that all day long. They have to be decision makers. Being forced to have to make decisions over and over again in a role, a 30-minute sparring session, you make hundreds of decisions of what to do with real consequences. And the best part about it is if you make a bad decision, guess what? Tap, start over, Mm -hmm. start the process over again. That is one of the hidden values in jiu-jitsu for law enforcement is that ability to be put in that situation where you're constantly in this decision-making process, this decision-making matrix that makes you a better performer when you're out working as a as a cop. Um, nobody talks too much about that. Everybody talks about, oh, you know, you can control someone, you can do the kimura, you can do this. More importantly for me, I think the true value in that is in that decision-making process, in that repeated process under stress. Nothing mimics a police officer under stress more, in my opinion, than jiu-jitsu. And not just in the physical realm, but cops go and testify. That is very stressful to testify. You must make decisions on how you answer those questions. You are dealing with a, with a person who is drunk and belligerent, doesn't want to fight you, but they're being very difficult. You must make those decisions under those stress, the right decisions. No other activity, no other martial art, I think, imposes that on us more than jujitsu. I mean, repeatedly. That's what we do when we roll. We make decisions. Um, Another aspect of that is, um, and, and uh, not a lot of people talk about this one either, is uh, you know, if you do jujitsu for a certain while, you'll sit there in bed at night and think, man, I screwed up. Why did I do that? Why did I put my arm there? Why did I move this way? Everyone <laughs> has gone through that and just like, ah, oh, the frustration. That process that you're going through is the exact same debriefing process that you would go through if an officer were to go through a critical incident. The value in being able to do that outside of that critical incident is, for example, Jay, if you're a working police officer and you shot someone under stress, if you are not used to being in that environment of that mental playback mode, Mm -hmm. the first thing that I would ask you as an investigator, which which I did for several years in investigating officer-involved shootings, is, hey, what happened? And you're like, I don't know. I have no idea. When you do jujitsu, you begin to see the value in that and that you see the moves and you can literally break down what happened. Where that is important for an officer, you can now articulate to me the exact feelings, emotions, what you saw and how you moved. And that makes all the difference in me suspecting that you committed a crime or suspect that you acted lawfully in defending yourself. These are the little things that I try to bring about when I when I teach defensive tactics. These are the things um, that I want my students who are law enforcement officers to think about. Not just not just the action, but the after action is important as well. Mm-hmm. Very important. If you can explain your decision making process, you will go much further into protecting yourself and your family after a critical incident. You know, these are just some of the things that that you uh, that are often overlooked when people teach officers. And and you were able to blend that in and and one be kind of almost the mirror and understand it's yes. a very important point. And every time decisions are made, people are affected by absolutely good or bad. Absolutely, yes. And and to be able to explain that decision, a lot of people can't. And to you and evidently portion of what you just said, how is that changing from be a student in jiu-jitsu, now as instructor? 
how is that flip from you? Wow, that 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 was um, out, well. First off, I'm, I'm, I I will I will always consider myself a student, and as a as an instructor, I do the same thing. I copy you guys. I copy you guys. I talk like you when I teach. It's funny. I'll use the same inflection. I'll do stuff, and you know, I'll say something, and they'll be like, "Hey, you said I, I know, <laughs> just I know, I'm copying them." I, I, I don't reinvent the wheel, but but that transition for me was difficult, and we talked about this um, very early on. It, it's important too that I would never, and I learned that from my instructors to take it away anyone's personality. Yes. I want the school has your face. Yes, and if then we can always learn and improve from each other, then. And I tell my students like, man, that's awesome technique. I'm a pretty good guy stealing techniques from people and put a little spicy on it and show back to them their own technique. But they go like, wow, I, I never seen that. It's like that was, that was just your move. I just that's, and, and that's why you're coral belt, not my yellow belt. <laughs> <laughs> but but going there and and how's the transformation for you? Because yeah, we. It's a two different positions, even though yes. every time you step on the mat is a learning process. Yes. It doesn't matter if you're a student or an instructor. And I have white belt showing me something like, hey, but do this again. And I learn from. Yes. A white absolutely. belt, different reaction from a blue belt. And I learn from. How's that for you? How is that? Well, you like it or not, you're the main guy on the mat. Yes. You're the head instructor, sir. Yes. Uh, it's, it's, um, it's, it, it was not an easy, and it still is not an easy transition. It's very difficult because our selfish, our selfishness sometimes tends to overtake our abilities as, as instructors. What I mean by that is, I believe that if you want to be an effective instructor, you have to teach from the heart, one hundred percent. You have to give everything you have to everyone on the mat, and spread it out equally. And then you want to train, but when you train, you train as an instructor. You don't train for you. It becomes very, very difficult, and 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 you know the the larger the school gets, the more weight you have on your shoulders. Heavy is the head that wears the crown, right? Yeah, yeah. And the instructor part, the teaching part is fun. The teaching part is I I love the teaching part. It's managing the personalities. It's telling people no. It's um, it's is making sure that everyone is progressing in their in their own way, even though you have to teach 12, 13 different people differently because of the way they learn. And you're always, there's always this energy consumption that when you're on the mat, because you're always feeding off of people, this interaction that goes back and forth. You're reading the room, you're constantly looking, you're keeping an eye out, see if there's a new student over there, you're, you're watching the white belt, seeing if they're dejected to see if they're getting bullied or, or see if someone's going rough on them. I mean, it's just this nonstop mix, but then I get to be a student and come here, right? So then I come here and everything just kind of, now I can be a student. You know, oh, yeah. I'm going to say something. I don't think I ever said that. Or maybe it's, I don't know, people can see there's a secret. But yeah, when you're on the mat teaching, you have all the students. And you have some students that are sometimes too aggressive or some students that are, are not so confident. And to me, it's trying to speak the language of jiu-jitsu. I'm gonna make some change on this person without speaking a word to them. It's just how I train with them. That is a way that I use a lot of times to make some kind of a good correction. Because you have some guys that they're not anymore, you have as much of that. Once in a while, very aggressive. Yes. Then I don't wanna go in the middle of the class. And even then sometimes, hey, we go with him, he's learning. But a lot of the guys too, I, I felt that they're not so confident on their training that I'm gonna train with them and he's gonna have the best train of his life to bring up his. Yes. That's something that as instructor, we we speak that language without saying anything. Yes. It's just putting yourself there and do that. And that's one of the things that I, I learned from my instructors and I pass that on to, when I teach now, I still do that a lot with my students. And I noticed that Jay, when he teaches now, he's doing the same thing with these guys. And uh, maybe we have a chance to be together seven days a week, 24 hours almost, <laughs> and, and and we kind of catch a lot of the things. And I learn a lot from him too, teaching Mark the same thing. But that's something that uh, that's very helpful for us as instructors to learn to use that almost like body language 
more than the words during some improvement on that process. I, I'm not here saying that I'm, I'm just able now after so many years to have that vision to make those little change. Yes. But following and see the growth of your school, and I think I can relate it, let's see, 50% to you is, how is that, and I'll get personal now, sir. Okay. Four kids, right? Oh, man, yes, four. And four <laughs> girls. Four <laughs> girls, yes, yes. Plus the wife and the mother-in-law. How yes, is that, and a man? Cat, and a cat and a dog. And a cat and a dog. How is that? <laughs> because I know sometimes I just, my house, like, uh, okay, I have three girls, two daughters and the wife. Like, I'm going for a run. I got to get out of here. <laughs> How is that for you managing that oh, and man. have a jiu-jitsu school and work as a law enforcement? How's oh, that? Man. How's the jiu-jitsu kicks in into that? Patience? Do they have patience with you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, first off, thank God for my, for my wife because she's got patience galore for me. My goodness, she she holds it all together. But but uh, no, it's 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 hard. But it it's uh, you know it's 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 the same as it's the same as running a class with 50, 60 people, right? I mean, it's the same thing. You just you you multitask, you triage, you. You know, you, your bone is broken, you're bleeding, you're dying. Okay, I'm gonna deal with the dying person first. You, you know, so you, you triage and, and and you make it work. And I think, um, you know, one of the things that jujitsu has taught me is sometimes plans are great, but man, being able to just adapt and handle things is better. And, and my wife talk about this all the time because we make, both of us together, we make some pretty life shattering decisions without really thinking things all the way through. Because I think, it, and it works for us. Some people need to have all the details, we don't. We just have the confidence that we're gonna make it work. And that's through jujitsu too, because as a white and blue belt, I'd get on the mat and be thinking, okay, today I'm gonna drill a triangle, I'm gonna arm drag, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do the triangle, I'm gonna do this. And the minute the hands touch, your head goes boom, your head explodes, <laughs> all the techniques come on, you're, ah, and you're fighting, right? And every single time, looking back now, when I get on the mat with a plan, I'm always disappointed. But when I get on the mat and I just kind of open up and just let things come as they may, I feel I have more success. Yeah, because that that is being connected to the pulse right. of the floor. We all, it's funny that it's kind of a, an observation that all the students have, and I make, I'm actually guilty of it from time to time, is uh, you'll see Jean-Jacques walk on the floor and then he kind of stops, puts his head down, hand under his chin, Yes. And he's in deep thought, and they're like, "Oh boy, here it comes. Where, what, what's it going to be tonight?" You know, he's thinking <laughs> about. But most of the time, he's watching the guys warm up, or he just sees something on the floor that's like, "No, this is what we need to address tonight." And it's, 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 it's not templatized. We don't right. follow like, "Oh, this is what we're going to do this week." It's like, "What do the students need at this moment?" And that connection is so so important because then it tells your student body that you that you're listening, right. you're paying attention. And, and, and to get to that point, you have to have a certain confidence in yourself yeah. to be able to pull it off. And I've been married uh, 27 years now. So I, you know, my wife Congratulations, and I- Congratulations, man. Thank yeah. you, sir. My wife and I have been partners for 27 years. So we, we kind of know each other. We kind of have the confidence that, hey, no matter what is thrown at us, we will make this happen. We never planned any of our kids. You know, it's like, ah. Eh. I had one student who was like, uh, hey, what do you do when the baby, you know, when they bring the man, baby home? Sounds, I just, sounds so much like Brazilians, man. Uh, <laughs> Brazilians, Filipinos, the same thing. <laughs> you know, just uh, same thing. It's all the same. But it's, it, you, just, you just do it. And you deal with the situation and, and, and you move through. You make smart decisions. I mean, you don't do anything silly or off the wall. But, you know, you, 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 you have the confidence to know that you can carry through whatever life throws at you. And, and we're at that point now. You have now. that confidence now. Just like you can get on the mat, Master John Jock, not have a lesson and have a lesson plan in five seconds, you know, we, it's the no, same no. thing. No, it, it's it's kind of a big, because you watch the classes every day, I'm always, almost every single class, and I kind of feel three guys having a hard time in certain positions. Yes. And the class is based on those three guys, but the whole group, it's doing that. And I always tell, look, if it does not work for you, it's not part of your game, at least now you're aware of in case somebody tries to do against yeah. you. Oh, we always, always talk about that. I, I, I kind of almost insist on that. I'll, you, you tell the student, look, 
some people, they have their flavor. Like some people just want to do the choke or some people just want to do the arm bar. And it's like, you know, you, but you have to learn like what's the best way to, to prepare. Expose. You have yeah. to have an exposure in order to understand it. You have to be exposed to yes. it. If I'm exposed to it, then at least I'm prepared for it when it comes to me. It's not about me having the choices that I need to do this. No, sometimes I just want you to understand it so that when it's, when it's coming after, after you, you know how to defend. Yes. You know? But another thing that um, I was having a conversation, actually my brother and I both were having a conversation with Jean-Jacques the other day, and this has kind of been sitting in my head for a while. It's a different, a different topic, but it applies to what we do. And because you mentioned it a couple of times, and it's something we all were fortunate enough to share. You walk on the floor, you have 40 or 50 people on the floor, and you're like, it's easy to have somebody tell you, well, how do you divide your time amongst all these people? It's got to be taxing. And it is. But if you flip it and don't think I'm dividing my time, no, I'm multiplying my time. Instead of 100%, now it's 5,000%. You know, it's like, it's, I'm okay, now I'm just going to have to amp up more to give more, not, okay, there's 50 people, I can only give a little bit of each one and I'm going to be so, when you walk in thinking that way, you're going to just, your energy is just going to die. Instead, it's like, whoa, I got to, level up it's, it's like i have one one of my friends and uh, he had his first kid and he was very happy and suddenly not playing much he's having his second child and he comes up to me very worried like man but two kids and all health everything's cool he's like no i'm i'm kind of uh, hitting my head because now i have two kids how do i divide my love with these two kids and I'm like Divide your love with your kids. What do you mean? You, you multiply. You're not dividing. Your heart was this big. Now it's this big. I have <laughs> two. You're not putting half. And that was something the same thing as jiu-jitsu here. It's come you just multiply the techniques in uh, every class, man. It's so amazing because I see such a so diverse. Yes, you have guys doing. Guard, guys passing and half guard and half everything is like I'm I like I'm watching a video a videotape every day that like, okay tomorrow I'm gonna teach something based on that. Tomorrow I'm gonna I mean as you mentioned the mat, the need of the group kind of tells you what to do. I remember the time used to be all written down, first class and if it then yeah. when the new student comes in is a process that has to go through, but after a while is the feeling of the mat that needs to be work around that. And that's what makes jiu-jitsu so organic, you know, and so not, um, and makes it an art form, a martial art, instead of a martial science, in my opinion, because you have hundreds of students, you teach them all the same, but everyone's different, which I think is beautiful. Yeah, we tell the kids, we're like, I want you to think of this mat like a big canvas, and you each have a, a brush, and you paint it whatever color you want, whatever style you want, your jujitsu is uniquely yours. I'm yes. not going to make you conform to anything. I'm not going to tell you what you can and can't do. Your, your arm bar is your arm bar. Your choke is your choke. But it's an art. It's yeah. And beautiful. basically, we are just providing tools for them to develop their own game. That's it. That's it. That's, that's the, my, one of my favorite parts of owning a school is seeing the change in people and being able to bring a service and bringing tears to parents' eyes who had kind of lost hope in, in their kids and their athletic ability and just having them be normal. I mean, especially now in times of COVID, having the kids' classes and having kids have a normal activity, man, that means everything to so many parents. That means, that means everything. So I, I, you know, come to, one, come, come to one of our kids' classes. And after leaving the kids' classes and speaking to the parents, I dare you. I dare you to tell us that what we do is not essential. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, I, man, for sure. And and I think is the way the way I learn and trying to make sure everybody sees is a jiu-jitsu school, it can be, at least my school I can tell for a fact that a very positive impact. And like you guys, your schools are the same. I never see anybody came to my school and get worse. They always get better with some of their lives. And that's yes. the main purpose of jiu-jitsu. To teach somebody how to fight is easy. 
But to teach someone how to use that in their life, then it's a little more challenge. Yeah, I agree. And yeah, you know that question is coming, you know, and <laughs> and you know, I want you to, I want you to tell me that from from the thing, from your heart, I know. And another day you came by and um, and you said that, and 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 now I realize after so many years that when we come and teach a class, it's not about us anymore. Yeah. It's a way that I put my ego down the drain. It's not about me. It's always about our student. That's the way I see. It. Whenever I teach the class, it's not about me anymore. It's about them. Yes. And who is Eric Archer? Who, who are Eric Archer can say, man, I, I want to hear that from you. I know a lot of things about you, and ninety nine point nine 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 point nine. I would say hundred percent. All good. This is this time that I know you, <laughs> but I want to hear from you, man. It, it's incredible because me and Jay, we saw a transformation on you with the jiu-jitsu, with all the years that we have together. You know, it's it's not about how old we are. To me, all my students, we have people that are older than me. It's for me, it's all my kids in a way, and uh, you are one of them. But uh, I want to hear from you, Mr. Acha. Who are you? Yeah, I, I thought I've been thinking about this question for. For a couple of weeks since uh, you know I was I knew I was going to come on here, and the answer is, is the answer is not so easy. It's it's a it's a very complex question. And um, for me, you know, I'm a kid. I'm still a kid that's looking for the next adventure. You know, I was I was I was a kid. You know, when we came here to America for my first adventure, I was a kid when I decided I was going to go do go be a cop on a whim. And then 27 years later, I, it was almost, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm now I'm running the adventure of school and continuing my journey in jiu-jitsu. I mean, it's just all about adventure. And the longer I live, the more I see these little segments in my life are nothing but big adventures. You know, so let's on to the next adventure. What's what, what's next? Where, where are we going? You said in the podcast, uh, well, you're like, you know, you you modify your dreams, right? You change it. So you chase another dream. Mm, and yeah, what's next? Yeah. Absolutely. So that's 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 what I am. I'm just ready for the next adventure. I'm the little hobbit, you know. I'm off on an adventure, <laughs> you know, running down, and <laughs> so I'm just just whatever life brings at this point. It, it's uh, you know, in a way, it, it's it's great because um, you are someone that has so much knowledge, um, and you always bring in the things that you write. And I can tell. Sometimes I say something and don't even realize what I just said but you have that capability to pick some of the things and you are able sometimes to even with what you see, write down and, and translate things that I, even myself, like I never kind of, uh, I didn't know the impact of something that I said or something that I showed had in people. This is a great quality that you have on that, observe those little things. And all these years that I know you, um, it's just getting better. <laughs> oh, I think like you, we all getting better for more adventures in life, and as friends, partners, and I'm looking forward for another. I don't know, thirty years, forty years, fifty years, hundred years. <laughs> uh, I'm in. Whatever it is, I'm in, Master Jack. You but, tell me, and I'll be there. But I'm now, in. and I just wanna also congratulate you for that amazing job that you've been doing since since the day we met the growth that you have, you know. Um, I'll be honest, I'm, I'm very happily surprised with a lot of things that turn out your way, very proud. I would not imagine how far would you, you would go, but I always make sure that you believe that you can. And you have one of the most successful schools in our affiliation. Yeah, you're you're kind of the case study that uh, when we, whenever somebody needs some guidance or mentoring, um, I drop your name and I explain to them a little bit about how you came to us, where you are now. I mean, we lean on each other. This is a mutually beneficial thing. You're not leaning just on us. It's like, I'm, you know, we're always asking, what are you doing too? Because the transformation for your business. And then again, you were a purple belt in an area dominated by black belt level instruction. And look at how successful you've become. So that's a testament to you, your hey. leadership. If, and if anybody out there, you know, is listening and contemplating, I don't care what belt you are, blue, purple, brown, it doesn't matter. If you provide a product and a service that people want, 
the belt is irrelevant. You be you, you do what you do best, and you believe in what you do and teach from the heart, and people will come, I guarantee you. And it's not that difficult. You don't need a special plan or a special, you know, thing. And like Master Jinjok told me a long time ago, he said, you know, every time a student comes into me, I don't look at them and say, oh, I'm going to make X number of dollars from them. I look at them and I say, I wonder if I can make them a black belt, you know? And it's that kind of faith in your students that's going to serve you well if you're thinking about doing the school. And don't, it's not that difficult. You just step by step, day by day, lesson by lesson. That's it. Mr. Air Catcher, see, and here I am learning from you too, yeah. my friend. Yes, yeah. every time I have those conversations, it's fantastic, man. Air Paul, once again, congratulations. Thanks for driving or flying in today to be here with us. It's always good to have you around, sir. It's amazing because you're, I mean, granted, you're what, about a 30 minute flight from us, but you're like a local affiliate because you're here. Pretty regular. That's a consistent thing for you. And bringing your students down. Team yeah. PSD always always shows the support. It's, so It's a must. It's mandatory. Right? <laughs> <laughs> but thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, sir. Uh, Here again. Sir. I'll see you guys soon for another adventure podcast. <laughs> Thanks, Mr. Archer. Thank you.